This week, we take to the seas once more with the Rebel Collection on Switch, combining two favourite Assassin's Creed games of that era into one package. That is Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag and the lesser known Rogue, with every DLC associated with them bundled into it, all of which tallies up a whopping 20GB install. So the question is, how does it stack up to the other versions? Of course, there's a precedent set with Assassin's Creed 3 on Switch already, a solid port, though with issues in audio quality and changes to its lighting, which was met with a mixed reception. For the Rebel Collection though, there's also the point that remasters of the game exist on PS4 and Xbox One already, where we enjoyed better textures and improved effects. So is this more in line with the last or current gen versions, or something in between? Let's find out. First up, it's a pleasure to see these games again. Both Black Flag and Rogue really put an emphasis on the ship battling. Calm coral blue bay areas quickly turn to stormy seas, a battlefield beholden to wave deformation that affects gameplay. It's exhilarating to watch, and really gets a good showcase in both games. What we have on Switch is a very well-rounded port of the experience, and in many respects it's better to play than PS3. That's mainly helped along by some key quality of life improvements, like the HUD is adjusted, HD rumble is supported, and there's use of the Joy-Con's motion controls for aiming. If you like the approach to Assassin's Creed 3's port, this basically follows suit. As a conversion, Switch is also a big upgrade on PS3's 720p native resolution. In each of the games bundled in, you're getting a dynamic 1920x1080 image while docked, which is really an excellent result. That's what PS4 runs at too in fact, though admittedly with no sign of dynamic res scaling in that case. So yes, the visual quality is marred a little on Switch by the scaling at times. In naval warfare and in dense forest spots, the lowest it can drop to is around 1600x900 in Black Flag. For Rogue, on the other hand, I've counted a little lower as the worst point at 1472x828. But on balance, it's surprising how much of the experience keeps up at 1080p. Also impressive is the portable experience shown here, is mostly fixing at 1280x720 to match the screen, with potentially, and let's be honest, quite likely, a similar dynamic res system in play. All round, good stuff for a 30fps game. Sadly, it's comparing to PS3 that we see, really, other upgrades aren't forthcoming. Sure, it's 720p versus a dynamic 1080p, and there's no question Switch is pulling off a sharper image. But the fact is, anti-aliasing is very limited in effect. It means every corner of the Abstergo areas, for example, or the netting on masts, gets very rough looking stair-stepping with no treatment. Compared to PS3, which is all the better for using a form of AA, it's not perfect, but still on balance, an upgrade. Equally, in comparison, it's clear Switch, yes, is indeed based on the last gen ports rather than anything newer. Though that's not to say it's simply a res boost. So what are the improvements? The first thing to point out is Black Flag now runs with high quality ambient occlusion, so better shade in between objects and that sort of thing. Better texture filtering as well, and also superior shadows all round. Textures sadly are exactly the same, as is vegetation quality, and NPC counts are perceptibly identical as well. It's very much an enhanced last gen game in visual returns then, though at least the blocky shadowing is replaced with cleaner lines, and textures look much sharper with the high quality anisotropic filtering. Even reflection quality is pretty much a match between them, which was an area of improvement for the remasters. Now, if we add PS4 into the mix, we start to see the clear divide. I've put Switch at centre here for a reason, since it does sit between the two overall. With a 1080p picture in fairness, it's close to PS4 in pure image quality, but does miss out on those luxury extras. The high resolution textures, for example, are gone, likely too much for the 3.5GB of usable VRAM on Switch. Equally, materials on character models are a clear step up on PS4, as is the improved screen space reflections, motion blur, and effects like rain. 
A form of tessellation, or at least improved geometry, is also used on rocks too, which Switch misses out on. Plus, of course, the interactive plant life of the remaster, shown here, with physics-based properties, now just sit idle on Switch. The Rebel Collection is essentially the last-gen edition running at dynamic 1080p then. A quick side note here. All round, it's an acceptable port given the frame rate performance, which I'll get onto. But it's also obvious sound quality, at least hearing Switch in isolation, is rather poor. It's mainly the compression on recorded dialogue that's a problem, and it does stick out. Privateering? Is it dangerous? Wouldn't pay so nice if it weren't. Well, why not sail with the King's Navy? Earn a proper wage, sail under gentlemen. Sod the Navy's gentlemen. Put some headphones on, as I did, and it sticks out as being very low bitrate, more so than I noticed on the other versions. Something to bear in mind if you have a keen ear or higher-end speakers. Otherwise, through the Switch's own integrated speakers, if you're using the Switch Lite, for example, it should hold muster. Revisiting this game has been fascinating, especially knowing the size of the game overall. Now, I've only had a few hours with each, but it's enough of a sample to get an idea of the frame rate and what you're up against. Firstly, the game does run at 30fps with VSync engaged as you'd expect, though weirdly enough, the minimap in the lower left corner updates at half that, seemingly, which can be a bit jarring. Rolling out a few clips of the first few hours, you do get a sense that this is predominantly a locked 30fps experience. This is Switch docked under a TV, and all round, it looks like the dynamic res system pays off. It adjusts the pixel count accordingly, too much load to sustain 30fps, it adapts and leaves us with this clear line. Now, Switch is by no means perfect. You'll notice frame pacing spikes scattered across the graph, which is again a sign the 30fps cap isn't implemented to the greatest effect. I've seen it on so many Switch titles by this point, and really this is not the worst case I've seen, just a bit frustrating. Also, there are actual dips under 30fps to report on. That opening sequence on the stormy seas really floods the screen with alpha effects. It's the point we see the resolution drop to its lowest point, and incidentally, it's buckling down to the mid-20s as well. Thankfully, this really is the worst I've seen it. Call it a bad first impression, but Trust me, it does even out mostly, especially once you reach the all-crucial big cities. That's the main point then, largely 30fps with potential for a few dips. Looking at portable play for a moment, it's a rather similar state of affairs. Actually, it's a fraction better. Those drops in the opening cutscene are reduced in severity. Clearly, rendering at 720p natively helps out a bit if the GPU is the bottleneck there and that results in a better turnout all round. So yes, portable play still drops, but based on this, will clear 30fps with fewer troubles, though frame pacing is still a factor. Everything considered, I'd call this a win, but nothing extravagant. The resolution is a huge increase on PS3, yes, but also the frame rate. First though, if we look at the way PS4 plays, we have a steady, perfectly frame-paced experience across the board, for Rogue and Black Flag. In that context, it's a shame Switch can't nail it to the same standard. But let's consider it next to what we had on PS3 last generation. There it ran completely unlocked, jumping between 20 and 60 FPS. Look to the sky and you'd max it out, but then cutscenes would plummet down to the low 20s. It was a mess, quite honestly and I much prefer the way Switch handles it with a form of a 30fps cap. Switch gets away with an overall clear upgrade in performance on last gen then. Plus, with the enhancements in pushing 1080p, better ambient occlusion and shadows, it's about what I'd expected. Nothing more or less. Anyone hoping for a kind of hybrid version, combining bits of PS3 and PS4, may be disappointed here though. The sound quality, again, is disappointing in parts. It may be to minimize the footprint on the install or even save processing on a CP thread, but that's how it's turned out. The package as a whole is still neatly put together if you can accept that. From the selection screen to the way it performs as a portable console, it's a fine way to return to two classics in the series. So, especially for a game like Rogue here, 
which was overshadowed somewhat by Unity on the then next gen machines, it's worth picking the Rebel Collection up if you're a series fan. What lays ahead for the series on Switch is potent though. For ports, the only way left is backwards it seems, towards the Ezio Collection, which already has an appearance on PS4 and Xbox One. To see the whole lineage on this handheld would be great, no doubt. But to me, the Switch does at this point deserve its own game, I think, with dedicated development. Something built from the ground up for it, in the way PSP and Vita had their own moments to shine. For now though, and as the final word, this collection is still a respectable way to visit an era of Assassin's Creed that's passed and that you may have missed. That's all from me today though, if you did find this analysis useful or insightful in any way please let me know by liking or subscribing and don't forget to hit the bell to get notifications as any new video lands. Don't forget of course to check out our Patreon for pristine high quality versions of this video and if you do want to get in touch with myself, Rich, John or Alex you can do exactly that through Twitter. But from me for now that's about it, thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Mr. Walpole, let's collect your reward.